Simon Rollo, good evening. Well done. Sub five days, four days, 22 hours and eight minutes, if I'm not mistaken, from Joburg to Bloberg, the new record. And uh, yeah, um, we're going to talk tonight. We're going to, Simon's going to take us through uh, the race day by day, bit by bit. And we're going to discuss a bit about logistics and food and the free state cuisine and all that's good on a thousand mile ride. Simon, take it away. You started at four o'clock on Saturday, the 12th of June from the Riviera Resort. Oh, yeah. Let's go back a bit before that. You had a, you had a nice eventful trip up from Richards Bay. Tell us about that one. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, well, I drove up the Friday night. Uh, thought it'll be all smooth sailing into Riviera for the night. And unfortunately, yeah, I had a bit of car issues where I was left stranded about 50 k's before for anything. I oh. uh, ended up needing a tow and yeah, uh, calling my old mate, uh, Mr. John Lewis, to get me get me to the, <laughs> to the hotel yeah, <laughs> prior so to curfew, no, no less. Yeah. yeah, so there was a bit of support needed for that part of the part of the trip. But uh, yeah, anyway, and then what you got about, so before you even started, you were lacking sleep. You you probably got to sleep about 11 and then you woke up at 3 or something like that. Yeah, I, got, I only got into sleep, well, probably about 11.30 by the time I'd got organized. So I was already under the, I was already sort of in, in race mode, if you want to call it that, you know. So, so sleep deprived from the start. Yeah, it wasn't a good good start. But yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, it goes to, just goes to show if the mind's right, you just deal with it. Eh? But um, yeah, so you left at 4 o'clock, headed off into the, into the free state and... Um, yeah, tell us, tell us a bit about the first day. Yeah, so first day, uh, first couple of hours all went extremely well. I mean, the, the first 30 odd Ks on the tar, no issues whatsoever, just a little bit on the cold side to start with. Uh, got off the tar into Wolverhook, uh, just started pacing myself on the dirt road, making my way towards uh, Copies and then Edenville. So all that area was all nice, not, not too much climbing or anything like that. It's just a consistent pace, no wind to speak of. Everything was going wonderfully well until I hit the tar. Once I came out of the copies uh, gravel and, and hit that 18k tar into Edenville, that's sort of where the wind actually picked up. And then I really knew, okay, today was going to be one of those days where you just got to sort of stay consistent and not try and really fight the wind, but you need to sort of just get your head down and just realize, okay, you, you're, in, you're in it for the long haul. Yeah. Um, now you you ride with drop handlebars. Um, some of us, like myself, ride with the normal old mountain bike handlebars and sit more upright. Do you think that makes a big difference? When, you know, to you spend a lot of your time in the drop position, and you know, when when you're against the wind, does it make a big difference? Yeah. So with the the gravel bike with these drop bars, I didn't think I'd need really wanted to add on the extra tri bars where you go into that even more aero tuck position. So what's nice is I can actually lean my elbows on where the, where the actual gear shifters are. It's got a little bit of a rise, which allows me to actually then go down into like a more like aero type position, similar to like an like the aero bars, but not have to actually have that extra additional weight. And it actually did help in certain aspects to try and just yeah. stay out of the wind as much as I could for that for those those couple of sections. Now, how, how long were your breaks? I mean, tell, to, where, where, where did you stop? Did you stop at Edenville and then Stainsris or, you know? Yeah. What, what, so, so first first break, I stopped at Edenville for about 10 or 15 minutes. Just quickly uh, stopped, grabbed a few cold drinks. The, this, that little garage there doesn't really have proper, you know, not a lot of warm type food. So luckily what I'd had is uh, I got like a burger or two the night before, which I put into the back of my my bag and I actually had that as my sort of my breakfast in Edenville. Just topped up the bottles with some Powerade and some Coke in that and then headed out to, on, on route towards Stainsrus. So that was the first type stop. Okay. And then Stainsrus another 10 or 15 minutes. You seemed, I sort of, it looked like from watching you on the dot that your breaks are generally very short. It's sort of 10, 15 minute type things and off you yeah. go again. Whereas we, us, us mere mortals tend to stop for an hour or so and sit down and order a big burger and chips and if we can find that and you know you you're quite quick yeah so what what i ended up doing is i actually bypassed dangerous i didn't actually go into the town at all uh when you come on the tar from the from edenville that that final five or ten k's after the dirt then you'd normally go left into dangerous i actually turned right made my way maybe three or four k's down the road and then actually had a little break just on the side of the road there just to yeah. avoid 
the extra th three or four k's into town or just about two k's into town the longer stop and then the two k's out so when i test rid rid ridden that section that, those couple of weeks before it actually i actually lost about 40 minutes going into town stopping at lombardo's and then out so i thought this would be the, the better way because my bottles were still full at that stage so i didn't really need oh, to so you didn't even really go really, in there you didn't really supply at all you had enough food i mean how, how much do you eat during a day i mean what what's how much you know like the i, don't, day, I so. don't really eat yeah so i don't really eat as much as one would think uh, I've actually learned to try and get by on as little as possible purely because I've done quite a lot of endurance type riding. So, yeah, you ideally do want to have a breakfast and then a, like a lunch and then normally and then a, a normal supper. So I, I'd still eat three times a day and then just try and snack in between. So if there is a place where I can stop, try and grab a banana or even an apple. I mean, an apple, one, one overlooks the yeah. importance of a, a little bit of fruit uh, on these type of rides, which actually adds a little bit of energy. So... I don't really want to have too many heavy meals as such, but you know, later on, as we as we will discuss, heading into the into the Karoo and part of the free state, I actually did battle to find quite a bit of food. That was that was a bit of a challenge. Yeah, but you stopped at Fentersburg. I stopped at Fentersburg for a while. Yeah, yeah. I actually went. Yeah, you know, I went past Stainsruss and I actually went into Fentersburg because yeah. from Stainsruss all the way into Fentersburg, that was probably when the wind was at its worst, where I was actually probably just averaging about 14 or 15. And I really th could feel like I was fighting against the wind and I was actually getting to a point just at Fentersburg where I thought, Phew, I need to actually have a little bit of a break. Yeah. And, and it actually did me well. Yeah, so I went in. It's pretty much there by the N1. They've got the little Shell Ultra City and the total garage there. So I popped in there. Yeah. Helped myself to a, gar a garage pie, which was actually fantastic oh, at that stage. The first pie and was good. Yeah. first pie, yeah. So I had uh, a pie or two, and then made my way uh, through to Eldam, and then into Winburg. Yeah, and you've got um, just remind me again two or two or three water bottles with you. Was it, was it three? I had four four water bottles. Four water bottles. Okay, and and I mean, how quickly, how quickly do you go through those that water? I mean, does that la did that last you like a full? Four water bottles asked you all the way from Edenville to Fentersburg, basically. It did. Uh, I just finished the, the last little bit just just prior, probably on the tar into Fentersburg. So that's where I thought, let me not overdo it because to get into Aldam and into Winburg was still a bit of a bit of a way ahead. So I thought, let me just stop in there, try and get out of the wind for a few minutes, for ten or fifteen minutes, and then yeah, give my legs a bit of a break, and then head back out uh, back on route. Yeah, yeah. What time did you get to Winburg then? Uh, plus, plus minus six o'clock. So I stopped at that little shop just there by the garage as you enter Winburg. So by the time I resupplied and everything like that, it was about quarter past, 20 past, where I made the call that I probably wasn't going to get into Bloemfontein because I, I still had a headwind. Even leaving Winburg, I was going to be on that Excelsior Road and I was still going to going to sit with a bit of that wind because it was still pumping one once I got into Winburg. Yeah. So 286 k's, if I remember correctly, and that's in about 36. How many hours did you? Were 12 you hours. 12 yeah. hours. Sorry. Just 12 oh. hours from four to yeah, four to six that night. So uh, sorry, uh, 14. 14 hours. 14, 14 hours. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So average yeah. just over 20. Yeah, yeah. And do you phone ahead for your food, or do you to to get them to hurry up, or do you get them wait for a hell of a long time for your steak and chips? Because that's important. No, well. While I was on route, I actually WhatsApped uh, Natasha there at Winburg to tell her that I was gonna. I already made the call once I got nearer Alda, knowing I'm not, you know, I'm already gonna be pushing my luck by the time I get into Winburg. Yeah. And yeah, once once I got on there, she already had a room ready, had uh, a nice steak and chips, mm. already organised breakfast that I could have the breakfast. Uh, they made the breakfast the night before because I told her I was gonna leave mm. early the next morning so that I could yeah. eat before I left as well. All right, okay. Yeah, that's one thing. For the you know for the listeners of this video to realize anybody preparing for the for the thousand miler is it's good to phone ahead um the people normally are quite helpful but it, they're not they're not in a hurry it's not mcdonald's fast foods in the free state it's it takes time no, so, it takes time yeah, you, plus you want to plan ahead for the breakfast as well so if you yeah. can if you know you're going to be staying over especially if you're going to leave early hours of the morning you know you don't want to be inconveniencing the people to try and get up and make your breakfast they're not going to yeah, you no, know they're not really going to yeah. want to do that so it's better to try and ask them if they can prepare the breakfast, keep it in the room, and then yeah, eat it that morning. You know, if you head out at two or three in the morning, just have it half an hour or an hour before you go, so you're already fueled up for the first part of the next day. Yeah, yeah. 
And so on you went. Second day was the big day. And what time did you leave Winburg again? Yeah, it's just off. It was about one one a.m., which was yeah. quite quite early. Just because I realised, you know, I missed the opportunity to get into Bloemfontein yeah. that that evening. So I needed to try and get a not get ahead, but try and make up for for time lost. Yeah. Because if I wanted to keep on schedule for that sub five day, I really, you know, I couldn't have left. I couldn't leave at four or five o'clock, or I was never going to make yeah. Colesburg. You know, the furthest I would have got probably would have been Harib if I'd left late on that that day. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, the gear shifters went, so it went a bit pear-shaped in Bloemfontein for a while. Yeah, so as I arrived in Bloemfontein, I was actually, uh, I was sort of in my third gear from, from, the, from the highest gear, and I noticed it wasn't shifting, shifting down. So I tried to go up and see if I could get it to come back down, and then I got stuck in granny gear. So, the, so for the last three or four Ks, my, my legs were going past my ears, <laughs> traveling at like 10 Ks an hour, because I literally had no no gears on a flat, you know, so I wasn't yeah. achieving any speeds in that. So once I got into Bloemfontein, mm. obviously I was trying to first figure out what the actual issue was itself, you know, because I had no, I mean, I've never worked with electronic shifters. Uh, Kevin uh, put that on the bike just a couple months ago. So it was fairly, all fairly new to me. Mm. And I eventually was able to get it sorted out about 90 minutes later, you know, to, yeah. luckily I, felt, oh, I got hold of Kevin because there's no other bike shops and he was at least able to direct me and explain to me how to open up the, the electronic gear shifts and, and at, I mean, at the end of the day, all it was is I needed new batteries. So that's how simple it was. But it, yeah. for me to figure it out, there's, there's some covers and stuff that, I, that you don't really see and you needed to actually swap swap out some batteries. So I did go get some extra batteries and yeah. swap it out. So an hour yeah. later, 90 minutes later, I was on my way again at least. Yeah. Seems like the Bloemfontein people are more God-fearing people than us Joburg people. So everything closes. There's no, there's no cycle shops open there on Sundays. Well, I, I drove through there and there was almost practically nothing open apart from your engine garages. So literally your garages were pretty much the only thing really open. There was not, I mean, I, I literally went right through the town. Luckily, it was a nice stretch of tar. So I was able to get through there fairly quickly. But yeah, on a Sunday, you'd think Bloemfontein, you'd, ha you'd, you'd expect to see a few things more open, being a bigger, bigger type city. But yeah. yeah, not on a Sunday. Did you actually at least stop for breakfast there or did you just mosey on straight through? Uh, well... In, in the 90 minutes trying to figure out what the problem was because I, I thought it was a synchronizing problem because there's a little button on the on the actual shifters that actually shows yeah. you a green or a red light and mine was just consistently showing red lights. Yeah. I sat on the cell phone trying to Google it and it was telling me to try and synchronize it and mm. so I had to push all sorts of buttons to try and get the, the back uh, yeah. battery and components to try and synchronize and then eventually it, it, nothing was working and then yeah. yeah obviously trying to get hold of a few bike shops everything's closed in bloom and then eventually i got hold of kevin and he said okay well here's try this and, and eventually i had to quickly try and get some spare batteries for the for the actual shifters on the handlebars because they've got their own set of batteries completely separate from down at the bottom where the cassette is yeah, yeah. so it was also i got it all sorted at the end of the day yeah. and yeah, yeah. and well, after that, at least from once I'd got that sorted out, I quickly grabbed once again another quick garage pile because Wimpy was out of the question because I originally thought I'd have a nice Wimpy breakfast because I was at the engine, there was a Wimpy there. They were sort of cleaning and getting ready to open up. So by the time I'd sorted everything out, they were open, but then I'd already lost 90 minutes. So it was, it was silly. I wasn't going to now sit for another half an hour and, and throw away two hours, which yeah. uh, you know would have cost me a lot more time. Sure. Yeah. T tell me, and... This, I suppose, begs a bit of debate. Um, do you think, ideally, on an unsupported ride like this, where if you don't find a bike shop in Bloemfontein, the next one you're going to find is in Cape Town itself, is it? Uh, do, you, do you think it's good to ride with these electronic gear shifters, or should one keep things as simple and have the manual stuff, which you can probably fix by yourself? What, you know, what's your take on that? Yeah. Do the, do the electronic well, the ones really make a difference? Well, that's all just purely weight saving and they shift, um, to be honest, they actually shift slightly better. So the electronic shifters actually shift a lot smooth, a little bit on the smoother side compared to your normal cable shifters. So, you know, had I known already, like I said, I was quite new to the electronic uh, side. I've, I've obviously been riding with it before, but not not getting into the, the nitty gritty and the maintenance side of it. Mm. So had I know simply just carrying those spare batteries and knowing where to open the fittings underneath the the handlebar, etc. I mean, I would have been able to have sorted it out within two or three minutes and been on my way. So I wouldn't have lost as okay. much time. So, so I don't think that, I think the electronic shifters for the rest of the ride, 
the, the bike yeah. worked like a dream. So I had no issues prior to that and after that. So that was, yes. I mean, it was so just. So once you know what you're doing, it's quite simple. Yeah, it was, it was yeah. quite quite easy just to swap yeah. out and then, yeah, I was back on my way again. Yeah. Tell me, and, and had you sort of quietly thought to yourself, were you thinking Colesburg all along on that day, at the end of the day? Was that the target? Well, originally it was still set to Kharib. But then as the day went on and I saw, listen, I've actually got favorable wind. You know, the, the first day, not so much, where I was battling a little bit. The second day, heading out of Bloom, those 20 or 30 k's out of Bloom, I was actually pushing between 25 and 28. Uh, after the tar section, you get on the gravel again and, and, and things were going quite nicely. So heading all, my, all the way into Edinburgh and yeah, everything was actually going quite nice. So I thought, well, once I, once I was progressing a lot further, uh, Colesburg was seeing more likely than not. Yeah. You know, originally the plan was Kharib, uh, mm. but yeah, once I got in there at about, I think about six o'clock or so, I realized, okay, well, it's still quite early and Colesburg was only another 65, 70. So to get in by about 10, at that stage, the curfew was still 11 o'clock. So I was still on, tr I mean, I got in at, at 10, so I still had an hour to spare yeah. in terms of curfew. So it actually worked out quite nicely that, that second yeah. day. And, and, and apart from Colesburg, um, the other towns all the way along, given that it was Sunday, I mean, what was open? Was there anything open for food or was it a bit of a struggle? I got into Edinburgh and there was no real food there. I got in, uh, I think I sent you a picture of a place called this little ghost supermarket, which is actually in the, the little township, the little location type area. So I was able only really to get uh, some, some cold drinks in there. And then I made my way out because there wasn't really much. There was a little cafe in that right at the end of the town by the time I had really filled up. So I didn't really stress too much there. I uh, then got onto the tar. There's 37, 38 Ks through to Tromsberg. And then once I got into Tromsberg, there's a garage which is quite next to the, the N1 highway. So I pulled in there, also topped up my bottles. Also, when I got in there, the, the food didn't actually look, there wasn't really much in terms of anything worth worthwhile grabbing. So yeah, I ended up just taking a, a two or three bananas and an apple and then uh, headed on further on towards Springfontein. Okay, well, Springfontein must have been pretty closed down by then or not really. Springfontein, there was a, uh, there was one shop that was still open where I was also I was able to grab a Lucas Aid in there. Uh, looked like a, like a Muslim type shop where where the, where the guys were still um, entertaining a few few clients here and there. So I was able to get one or two things in there and then uh, made that the, the next trek through to Kharib. Kharib must have been all pretty close by the time you. What time did you get to Kharib? I got into Kharib at six. So that that garage as you as you turn onto the tar and left in before you go through towards the dam that was still open but okay. when i got in there the lady said she, she's actually they were actually closing so they weren't prepared right. to make me any hot food so that oh, was a really it's, an issue you, yeah, so, it's, it's tough on sundays and it's tough uh, in the week after you know, after about five six things start shutting down generally yeah okay yeah so i just really once again topped up some bottles uh i think i grabbed a few just like some of these jelly sweets those energy sweets just to, to tie yeah. me over and then uh, headed out. Yeah, as I actually walked out the doors, they actually locked up and started switching the lights off. So I just just luckily made it in to get some some cold drink at least before the final trek through to Colesburg. Yeah. So Colesburg is nice. It's on the N1 and it's a 24-hour town. There's stuff open there all night. The, the engine and the Kentucky and what have you. I guess it was Kentucky for dinner at 10 o'clock in the evening. Yeah, it was, it was KFC. So that, that actually felt quite good because obviously from Bloemfontein all the way through was quite a long stretch. And not really having eaten through the day because once you got once I got into Edinburgh and I had that little uh, supermarket that's sort of like a little you know uh, slight little cafe but not much really in there. Get through to e to Tromsberg and that little garage didn't have much. Springfontein, not really much. And then even Kharib where the, where they weren't prepared to make any food. I mean I'd already gone through four towns without really eating apart from one or two bananas. So mm. once I got into Colesburg, I mean that Kentucky yeah it, it looked. Yeah. Looked and tasted divine, yeah. <laughs> like home cooked food. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And so the Marina Inn, and that's a 24 hour hotel, which is useful. And then what time? Yeah. Did, so, so, so day three, you left Colesburg at what time? I left Colesburg the next morning at about 4 a.m. Okay. and then made my way through to Hanover. Hanover arrived pretty much at about 8 a.m. What was for breakfast before 4 a.m.? Left over Kentucky or what? Uh, I didn't have breakfast that morning, unfortunately. 
Have you, have you have you done a lot of training fasted to be able to ride with without with just water? Do you is that is that something you do in your your training? I know Josh Sambrook, the marathon runner, he runs his marathons purely on water fasted, and he, he says you can train your body to do that. Have you done a lot of that or not really? Because yeah, so all my training I normally do on a all the training I normally do on a weekend I tend not to eat until I actually get back from my ride. Okay. So within within a half an hour after finishing your ride is when you want to get that fuel in because that's yeah. the your optimum time for recovery. Yeah. So once you get back from a ride, you don't want to leave yeah. sit sit around for an hour and then try and eat. Your your so you your recovery time breakfast? is probably within thirty minutes. And you don't have breakfast or anything before you go for a ride. You just go out and ride. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I tend to try and not do that. I take a banana with me and and a few energy bars and things, but I t yeah. I tend to come back with most of that stuff anyway. It's just there for as a as a backup type thing and, and is the idea of doing it almost fasted is that to teach your body to burn fat is that the whole idea of it well i, I dropped four kgs in this ride to be uh, once i got back i was actually quite oh. shocked that i'd actually dropped it as much as what i did because i didn't really get to eat apart from the two kfc's in colesburg and in series there wasn't yeah. really that much in terms of great food um, yeah yeah but it seems like you can sort of train your body to burn fat um it seems like that's what yeah. you almost do yeah because you you're eating a hell of a lot less when, when I go down that route or whatever. I, I have a lot of food. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of eating that goes on. Okay. Um, if you if you prepare to wait, you yeah. I mean, if you can sit for half an hour or, or an hour and you can wait for the guys to make the yeah. food, you can. I mean, there's definitely you definitely can find it. It's not that it can't be found. It's just for me that's on a. Remember, I'm trying to reach a specific uh, deadline. Yeah. No, so sure. for me to sit and wait a 45 minutes or an hour for them to make food, yeah. like you say, I mean. The, the places aren't the quickest to make food unless you go into a KFC where it's where it is a, a normal fast food type place. You, you are going to wait. Yeah, no, it's interesting. It just seems you can almost train yourself to go, but get to get by with less food. Um, but the uh, so, so so day three was a bit of a short day by comparison, if I remember correctly. You left at so you left yeah. at four o'clock, and then I got in at six. Yeah, Hanover first stop and. Just after between Richmond and Hanover, between Hanover and Richmond is the halfway mark. Okay, so that's a good going. Um, and then you turned at Rich, well, yeah, you turned at Richmond, and that's where the problem started. So just prior to turning at Richmond, about twenty k's before Richmond, I could already feel the wind slightly uh, from from a crosswind, but slightly into me. It wasn't as wasn't too bad, but knowing that that. That side wind was there. I already knew because I knew I had, had, had to turn right into towards Victoria West. Mm. So those 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 twenty k's was already starting to 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 feel slightly worse than what the first half of the day was. So I made my way into Richmond. There I actually had some uh, some toasted sandwiches. I actually stayed there a little bit longer than what I, I probably should have. But I was hoping the wind might have just died down slightly you know, just before getting out, which, yeah, in, in hindsight, it actually got worse. It didn't actually get any better. Yeah, yeah. Um, where did you stay in Victoria West? Are you, I think you stayed on the far side of town at the Popeyes or something. Right at the end at the Popeyes, yeah. It's just, just before you leave town, probably about five, 500 meters before the end of the town. Yeah. But when you got to Victoria West, there were probably plenty of, it looks like a bit of a touristy town. There must have been plenty of places, plenty of options to stay at. There's, there's only one restaurant in that whole town. Uh, in terms of accommodation, it's okay, but there was only there was only that one restaurant. I actually, the, the, the lady that where I actually stayed, she actually gave me the menu and said, you better phone this place because this is the only place you're going to get food if you want to get something. And I actually ordered myself a spaghetti and I got myself a, yeah. a burger. And that so that I actually got a decent meal in there that, that, that evening. Yeah, was, that uh, the and actually, was that the restaurant at that hotel? Yeah, it's hotel. called the Marina Restaurant. It's called the Marina Restaurant. It's actually at the far end yeah. as you come into Victoria West. So I actually had to walk about 1.2 k's in oh. my cycling shoes. Okay. <laughs> and what, what, I didn't have any other shoes. And what time does that? Re what time do they close on a standard day? I think they were closing at about half past eight, nine o'clockish. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it wasn't too late, but it was also not too early. So if you decide. Let's say you, you only made Harip the night before, and now you have to push through to Vic West. You're going to probably only get in there at like nine, ten, or maybe ten o'clock if, if the wind's not too bad. Yeah. So you might end up missing that restaurant. So yeah. you need to to really plan in terms of getting into Vic West because everything once once that restaurant closes, there's there's nothing really there. And, and even the place where I stayed, they couldn't provide any meals. Okay. Well, then, yeah. Okay. Okay. And then on you went to Loxton. Tell us about Loxton. 
Great. Well, the next morning, uh, I headed out at about 2 a.m. from Vic West thinking, okay, well, at least the wind should be over. But yeah, I, mean, I sent you that video with in the dark. And that first two hours was pretty much how I ended off the, the previous day. Went up those climbs. You, you had those two quite, quite steep climbs uh, to get out of Vic West and then heading towards Loxton. And then once I was down those climbs, the wind actually dropped completely and... The last uh, 40 k's was actually a nice descent into Loxton and I got in there probably about 7 o'clock. Uh, actually a bit too early because the town was still closed completely. There was actually literally nobody nobody around, nobody awake, no cars, nothing moving in that whole town. Yeah. So that's the big thing. Don't get to a town too late and don't get there too early. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was a big day. You got to Sutherland. What time did you roll into Sutherland eventually? I got in there at about half past eight that night, mm. but once I'd left uh, Loxton again, probably 10 k's after turn, making the turn towards Fraserburg, also once again, wind picked up. I sat doing about 14, 15 k average all the way into Fraserburg, and it actually was uh, the last couple of k's, it actually started raining as I entered Fraserburg. Yeah. And uh, I stopped off at that JJ Cafe. Uh, they had some burgers in the fridge and, and a sandwich in the fridge, you know, obviously pre packed. So that was sort of my, because I hadn't really had breakfast uh, leaving Vic West and I couldn't get anything and Loxton because it was still too early. So I just uh, had a bit of a meal there at Fraserburg just to try and tie me over until I got into Sutherland. Did you, did you plan ahead and stock up at Fraserburg for the night, given that you'd probably get to Sutherland and I'm guessing everything was closed? Or did, did, you, did you buy stuff at All the last? Yeah. Last time when I got into Sutherland quite late, the, the restaurant was still prepared to make uh, food for me. Mm. And it's only once I got up to the to the telephone towers, uh, the, those telescope towers up at the top, the observatory, mm. where they had actually said to me, sorry, but they're not going to be able to prepare food. So by then it was actually a little bit too late. So I, I'd actually thought I was able, still going to be able to get a, a decent meal in the, at the actual restaurant, at the Sutherland Hotel, because that's what they, they did for me last time. Yeah. And, they, and so you, you basically... Had a night without supper and you didn't have breakfast for the next morning. Yeah, so I left. Yeah, so I didn't have supper that evening. Uh, I just ate, basically ate an energy bar. That's the only thing I could because I needed to get some sort of fuel. Uh, basically, had an energy bar. Got into, you know, had a sh quick shower. Got, in, got into bed, did, uh, did my video and all that, and then uh, slept. And then the next morning, set it out at 3 a.m. Did you at least have a good stash of energy bars or not really? Ah, I came back with half of them. So even there, I didn't really eat all of the okay. all the energy yeah. bars that I'd planned to. So I actually overpacked as well, which yeah. I mean, rather have too many than not have enough and you need them. So Okay, so you did have some sort of emergency fuel on you just for lack of meals. Yeah, okay. That's it. And then you left Sutherland at about 2 a.m., I think, something like that. Was that right? I left Sutherland at 3 a.m. 3 a.m., yeah. Okay. 3 a.m. How was the road so, going out of Sutherland? No. The first part, first three or four k's is tall. You, you make a right and you make your way towards Oberach. So that's all di district road. You, you do quite a uh, bit of a climb to get up to the top where Oberach sits and then you do that quite treacherous descent. What, what was the condition but, of the road? Uh, the first part right up to the top where Oberach, uh, Oberach was was actually quite nice. It was a uh, normal district road, no issues with it. Uh, it actually was, was riding quite nicely. No, no real, the wind was all perfect 100%. The conditions were actually quite ideal. Mm. I, I myself was a little bit on the tired side because actually when I came down over, I actually uh, stopped two or three times and actually laid on the ground just because my eyes were just closing. I couldn't, my eyes just didn't want to stay, stay awake. Yeah. Just from, yeah. from obviously the, the lack of sleep. Yeah. Um, and, and on your way down Oberg, I mean, did you, were your brakes getting rather hot or did you have to stop and cool them down a bit or? I didn't have to cool them down. You could hear the, the, the screeching of it. So what I did was I tended to just rotate between the front and the back one. But I came down there quite, quite cautiously. I was only averaging about 10 or 12 k's an hour that, right. down those, those sort of uh, hairpins. Uh, yeah, no, it's, yeah. It's, it's rather a rough road. Now, that always concerns me on those big drops or whatever is where you have to brake all the time is burning your brakes out, yeah. Um, yeah, so you just rotate between the front and the back. You don't want to be on both brakes the whole time because then they're both just going to get hot and okay. yeah, get, end up with a bit of a... Yeah, okay, I learned, never too old to learn, yeah. Okay, and then um, and then on you went through the Tankwa and on your way down towards the Patstal. What happened next? Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, so once coming down Obach, I reached the, the river lodge about half past seven that morning. I basically unkitted a little bit because by then it was starting to get a little bit warmer. I was able to drop one or two layers, made the right turn towards that Tankwe guest farm. Did that long uh, 90k loop from the river lodge all the way around to the Tankwe putt stall. And yeah, on the way back, it was actually quite nice because the, the wind was actually favorable and I was able to push quite fairly fast 25 to 28 average for those 20 or 30k. So I was actually made, I actually made up some nice time there, pulled into the Tankwe putt stall, not realizing what my dreaded fear was that they were closed being a Wednesday. So I've, I've lesson learned. <laughs> so next time I'm going to do this, I'm going to need to start on a, on a Friday or a Sunday to make sure that because otherwise I'm always going to be there on a Wednesday. Is is the is that the day? Is that the only day of the week that the putt stall is closed? Yeah, literally the sign says open nine to seven, nine to five every day except for Wednesday. So Wednesday is the day they're not open at all. So it's not like a, a shortened time or anything like that. So if you get there on a Wednesday, yeah, you just have to you're gonna have to soldier through to series. And 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 Sunday is well, open on Sundays. Sunday they open, yeah, they open uh, normal hours. So I was actually quite fortunate in that when one actually arrived there, there was actually a camper van there with some guys with, with a family that were just uh, obviously taking in the views and taking in the sights. I pulled in there, you know, the guys could see, listen, this guy's obviously <laughs> slightly dehydrated, slightly hungry, <laughs> could eat a horse just at that stage. Bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Okay. Just <laughs> yeah. a little bit. Yeah. yeah and they yeah. took pity on me. The guy went into his camper van, made me some nice ham and cheese sandwiches, brought me out a couple apples and, and yeah, gave me a bot bottle of pump water and, and, and an iced tea. They even gave me a Heineken 0, 0.0, which uh, I obviously couldn't drink that because that yeah, <laughs> it wasn't going to go down well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so, so there we will. So I got time. spoiled. There we were all the time thinking you were suffering on without water and food all the way to series. And meantime, you'd had a nice restock. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was actually quite fortunate uh, okay, to, yeah. to, to get that because, I mean, it's, it's about 90K still from, uh, from the putt stall through to series. So it's still yeah. a long way. It's still quite a few hours because you have to go up uh, Burswarmut, which is quite a tough, I mean, 14, 15% gradient climb at, at stages. So it's, yeah. it's a slow, slow going climb to get up that, that pass. And then get down, drop down, back on the other side of series. Yeah, and then when did you roll into series? What uh, that was about six o'clock, if I remember correctly. Yeah, uh, so about six thirty that that evening. Mm -hmm. so I arrived six thirty. Uh, obviously, now being in one of the main towns again, there was yeah. I dropped in the, once again. The KFC uh, rescued me for mm -hmm. a, for a second time. Uh, stopped in there for a load of chips and a mashing gravy and uh, all those things that you mentioned in the previous video <laughs> had it all and excellent yeah it's, it's actually amazing how you when you when you reach a town like series it seems like a monster city after what you've been going through the last few days it's a, you know, yeah it's nah. just like heaven eh? all the stuff that like civilization there. like civilization yeah, yeah. seen it for a long time yeah yeah i yeah, know cheap pies and coffee and cappuccinos and anything you want it's there it's like luxury yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I tried to avoid the pies because i'd been through the pies so i was trying to see if i could actually get some proper <laughs> some a little bit better better type food just to try and mix it up a little bit yeah yeah no, anyway and then on you went to down the down the big hill down mitchell's uh, mitchell's pass down neverberg pass and on to cape town yeah um and yeah so i did that section went through uh past worsley gouda i stopped in quickly at gouda just to refill my bottles because i didn't actually really refill up in series because i i was focusing too much on the kfc so by the time i got into gouda i thought Shish, actually let me fill in the bottles because it was starting to look like there was a chance I was going to go all the way through. Because originally when I left series, I thought, okay, let me try and get past Wesley Garda and then Rebecca Castile was where I thought that might be the area I might end up uh, stopping for the night because it was going to get to about 10 p.m. for the curfew. Yeah, yeah. Was, there, was it raining that, that day? I can't remember. No. It didn't, no, it didn't rain that day. It rained the day before all the way up into South Sutherland. So from right. just before Frasersburg yeah. into Sutherland was full out rain, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you put the hammer down and headed for home, and you got to Loburg at about two o eight, I think, something like that. Yeah, two o eight. Yeah, that that morning. So I was quite quite happy to finally get it get it in and get it done uh, yeah. prior to the yeah. four a.m. cutoff. Yeah. Otherwise, I mean, if I had to have stopped, I, I would have been past the five day because I would have only 
been able to start up that next morning again. Yeah. Now tell me, are you, so, so to get to all the logistics and that, I mean, okay, you obviously learned a few lessons on planning for food and late night uh, arrivals in places where things are closed and, and Tanqua Patstall that happens to be closed and things like that. So there's, there's a few planning lessons, I guess you learned from that point of view, but your, your, your kit, anything that, um, anything that you would do differently with regards to lights and bike and, and stuff? Oh, I just took one light with my extreme light battery and that, that lit pretty much held me the whole way. So in terms of light, my Garmin, I had that spare battery pack that kept the Garmin charged. So those two things were all good. Actually, in, in hindsight, overpacked in terms of kit, knowing that mm. the week before I left, it was like minus seven in Bloom and minus six here in Sutherland and everything. So it was actually looking like it was going to be quite a freezing type ride. Yeah. And I think the coldest I got to was minus 3.4 on the Garmin. So it wasn't mm. quite as cold. It was still cold. I mean, make no mistake yeah. about it, but it was not the coldish ride that I was anticipating so I, I actually had a few extra layers still in the bags which i never really got to use which was yeah. nice in a way but yeah obviously it yeah. sort of takes up a bit of space and it's like a minuscule extra bit a little bit of weight which you know if you can try and sort of drop you know not not take stuff that you don't really need that just makes it more optimal you're, and you're 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 not having a rear shock and, and, and that front lauf shock, is that, was that sufficient for the roads, the corrugated roads in sections? Yeah. Not the, did you have your regrets about not having a bit more shock? I was actually super impressed. I mean, I had no saddle sores. I had no, when, when I finished, I mean, I could still sit on the bike. Normally by day four, day five, you can actually feel it when you get on the, that morning, you know, and you start your next day's ride, you can actually feel a bit more sensitivity. And I, I was actually super fine. Yeah. all the way up to the end so in terms of comfort that lauf actually looked after me the gravel bike performed like a, an absolute trooper yeah so I, I couldn't have asked for a better bike to be honest yeah, yeah. no punctures or any stuff like that no, no. punctures nothing yeah. like that no so, yeah. yeah so the bike actually performed sp fantastically well up yeah. uphill downhill all, all the terrain even the corrugation there was quite a bit of corrugation and even on that corrugation i was the actual that that front shock took a lot of the punishment and took a little bit of the pressure off my hand, you know, off, off the body. Yeah. The, only, the only downside, which I'm still having a bit of the effects on, and still my fingers are slightly on the numb side and my the, the palm of my, my hand here is still slightly, yeah. Yeah. you know, quite a bit on the numb side, yeah. So that's, well, that's well, the well, only real side effect. Squeezes the nerves is a name for it and it sort of takes a while for, takes a while for the, the movement and everything to be fully, what, what do they call that? Yeah. There's a name for it. Isn't yeah, I'm not sure myself. But... Carpal tunnel syndrome or something? No, I don't know. Something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No. Let, let me not become a medical expert. It takes about it takes about two weeks or so for me to get the, the rid of these type of uh, you know sensitive hands and, and mm. pins. It almost feel like pins and needles in your finger pin. Yeah, you know, the fingertips. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I mean, just so it was important to tell the listeners that it does actually return to normal eventually. It's a fairly normal yeah. part of this long distance riding. Um, yeah, especially when you're riding that, that many hours a day. I mean, some of the days, I mean, look at that last day. I was on the bike for 23 hours and eight minutes. I mean, that's, that's super long. It's, it's yeah. a long, long stretch. Yeah. Now tell me, so, so the one thing, the other thing that logistical issue that I think one's obviously got to think of is, you know, you um, you probably only have one cycle bib. I don't know if you take two, but, you know, some of us just ride for one cycle bib for a good number of days and these type of things to save weight. Um so what do you do bum cream wise or whatever to prevent all sorts of infections and bacteria? Yeah, so I still had the, the normal chamois cream that I, that I put on. Uh, I also had uh, well, pretty much your, your bib. And then I, what, I, what I tend to do is I take a pair of stockings, which I put underneath. Mm. So it's a layer underneath my, my actual bib itself, yeah. which actually doesn't allow so much the sweat to actually reach my bib which takes away a little bit of the bacteria type because I don't have direct contact between okay. your skin and, and the yeah. bib itself. Yeah. So that, that, that worked for me on the previous two, uh, the previous thousand miler as well. Okay. Is your chamois cream a type of antibacterial stuff or you, you don't just the normal chamois cream that, yeah, just the normal chamois cream. Uh, I've, I've worked with that and it's, uh, 
the first two days I didn't even use it. I only put it on from day three, four, and five, just as a protection, you know, just as a as a backup, just to make sure that I don't get saddle sores. But okay. the last couple of long distance rides, I haven't had any issues with it. Yeah, I know some people use Fiss and Baby Bum cream, and and then the other trick is also to mix Bactroban with the chamois cream. You, yeah, okay. yeah, that also works as well. I mean, that also yeah. tries to get rid of the bacteria. Uh, yeah, for me, I, mm. pretty, I try and go a little bit hardcore. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, no, yeah. Well, you do sound, yeah, it does sound like you go rather hardcore. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, the, I'm the creature of luxury by comparison, I guess. Yeah. Okay, and um, yeah, yeah. Any other, any other sort of lessons learned? To, I I'm, I'm trying to think of, you know, any other um, issues to raise. But it's, I mean, it seems like you had a fairly smooth ride, apart from your gear changing. And then a bit of lack of food at some point, but but other than that, I mean, it was all a fairly smooth ride. I, I'm I'm guessing that your I know you were trying to be modest and humble before the time, but but I sort of guessed all along that sub five days was your target. Yeah, well, sub. I mean, I wanted to get near the five day. I would have I definitely would love to have gone under the sub five, which I was luckily able to achieve on yeah. the final day. I mean, in hindsight. Had I not really left a little bit earlier and had favorable conditions, I mean, if I didn't have really a little bit of a tailwind through the, the putt stall, it would have made getting to Blobach even more difficult. I mean, so yeah. Sutherland to Blobach is still a heck of a way to do it in one day. I mean, ideally, I would have loved to have found accommodation 60 Ks into the Tankwa, because then that just makes yeah. that final stretch slightly. So that we've, we've got to try and find some sort of accommodation in that that area that'll allow you allow the guys to get an extra two hours or three hours ahead that that'll limit having to go through to two three in the next morning yeah so yeah. Mm -hmm. in hindsight yeah i'm happy with the five the sub five i mean and to do that on this type of route which is mainly gravel i mean you've got your few sections which are tar which do help you know speed up the process a little bit but it's not it's not hundreds of kilometers of tar you know it's just going through this going through a few of the towns, getting through Kharib, through Bloemfontein. Yeah. The, ni the, ni the nicest probably tar section that I got was between Tromsberg and, and, e and e Edinburgh. Mm, that nice was actually quite a nice section. Yeah. That was actually quite a nice little section as well. So there is sections that do speed up the process, but yeah, majority, being the majority on gravel, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's automatically going to slow you down. So to, to get a sub five day is, yeah, it, it is a good achievement, I think. Yeah. I, I see. I remember you had sort of mountain bike type tires, quite thick tires. Would you, would you suggest going with thinner gravel bike type tires to speed things up, or not really? You could definitely, because the, the terrain most of the way is not that bad. So if you get on a normal gravel bike and then put on those the, the normal gravel tires, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that could probably yeah save you in, in a couple couple minutes here and there uh, each day, and you could probably get there slightly quicker. Yeah. Just the, the big thing is the towns is, is to get, are you able to get another town ahead? That, that's the question. Yeah. It's not so much, I mean, you could probably get into your accommodation 20 minutes or half an hour earlier and have a little bit more rest, but to make it into the next town, that's where I'm finding the, the towns are quite far spaced between each other, which means to actually get through from the one town to the next, you need to have quite a, a, a big gap, you know, a, quite a, a wide window. Yeah. Not not just make up half an hour or an hour because that's not going to get you into the next town. That, that's yeah. pretty much no, it's not, uh, not like Europe where you've got towns every twenty k's or so, so you can just go one or two further if you've got the time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you look at that last day, I mean, once I'd left series, you literally had Wosley, Gara, Rebeck Castle, um, Malmesbury. You had those sort of towns within like twenty or thirty k's apart from each other. So that last day, hundred percent. But then. Mm -hmm. You're so close to the finish, you don't really want to stop in those towns and then have to do the final 40 or 50 or 60 Ks on the last day. I mean, that's, yeah, yeah. you know, especially if you want to get finished. Sure. Coming to the end now, Simon, what's your plans? What's what's next? Well, I'm still deciding whether I want to do the upride first or if I want to possibly look at doing the double, going down and then going back up. Uh, Work-wise, I need to still see if I can find a window. Uh, I mean, to go to, to do the upright five days, I think might be a bit bit of a challenge, especially trying to get back up that Obach Pass and that because remember you're coming from sea level all the way up to, to Joburg level. So I think to, to break five days there, unless you've got totally favorable conditions with nice tailwinds all the way, I think five and a, between five and a five and a half days would probably be yeah. 
yeah. a, a still a very good ride to go from down to up. But my, my long-term goal, especially if I can find a window in the next couple of months, is to actually do the full double. Go all the way down, say hello to Ingrid, make me a quick pasta, and then turn back. But don't stay there too long, or you're not, you won't want to leave. No, don't, you know, get, that don't, type. Get, don't get comfy at Ingrid's place or at Eden on the Exactly. Road, you're not going to return. Yeah, no, no. I'd, I'd no, no, get no, out of there very quickly if I was you, yeah. Quick as okay. you can. Quick, yeah. quick supper and away you go, type thing, right. yeah. Excellent. Well, there we have it. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Simon Rollo, the record holder for the 1,000 miler. And um, and that seems to be the plan, the double. So that's what we've got to look forward to in the next few months, hopefully. Um, dot watching deluxe coming our way, hopefully, in the not too distant future. Simon Rollo, thanks for coming on, on the Zoom tonight. And um, we'll no doubt see more of you very soon. Thanks, John. Yeah, it's great to have me. Thanks, thanks very much. Appreciate all the support and all the all the positive messages and everything that everyone's been sending on the dot watches and on, on all the chat groups. It's actually been fantastic. Oh, well, thank you. You entertained us for a week and kept us out of our work and disrupted our lives, and and we're very grateful to you for that. Fantastic. Let's see who's next. Thanks, eh? Cheers. Thanks. Cheers, John. Bye.